Welcome. Welcome to everyone. Um, let's gaze the words launch for Love is for Losers by Vivka Brugman. Thank you all for being here. We've got some excited comments already in the chat box happening, so that is great. Um, I want to let you know that we're going to be wrapping up this evening with a Q&A. Um, and so if you come up with a question throughout, I'm going to be monitoring the chat box throughout the discussion between Bethany and Vibka. So if you have a question, uh, do pop it there um, and I will be, um, um, yeah, monitoring those as we go. So um, before I introduce Vibka and Bethany, we're going to do some visual descriptions of ourselves for anyone who is um, uh, visually impaired watching this now or on the recording. So I'm Erica Gillingham. I'm a bookseller at Gaze the Word Bookshop. Uh, I'm a queer white femme in my mid thirties. Tonight I'm wearing a, a white button up shirt that has sparring unicorns on it. I'm very excited about this. Um, and I have some uh, red Mylar balloons with me in the office um, that are amongst my bookshelves. So that's me and I'll pass over to Bethany. Hello, it's me, Bethany. Um, I am a rather, you know, glamorously made up white fat lady with short dark hair and a red hairband and cool earrings that I made myself. Um, with a less exciting background of some yellow paint. And Vibka? Hello, um, good evening. My name is Vibka and I am a very old German immigrant uh, sitting in uh, my front room, um, which I have made to look like a charity shop. So you'll see some books and there's a little bit of bric-a-brac, which is a pound each. Um, also have some red hard balloons and, and I look fabulous. She does look fabulous. She also has um, a cat, a heart and a rainbow pinned into her hair, which I'm so into. Thank you so much. Now let me officially introduce uh, these incredible women who are here with us tonight. So the chair for this evening is Bethany Rudder. Bethany is a gal about town from Southeast London. She's a copywriter and author of two YA novels, No Big Deal, and my personal favorite, Melt My Heart. Uh, she also makes cool earrings that she's wearing this evening. Vivka is a professional writer, an amateur musician, and art historian. If she'd been any good at numbers and understood the law of physics, she'd be a commercial airline pilot. Her debut novel, Love is for Losers, is out now. Congratulations. Uh, and welcome, Vivka and Bethany. I'll pass over to you. Thank you so much. Um, I'm so delighted, like just genuinely delighted to have been asked to do this because I love this book um, and I'm just really happy to be here chatting to you. Um, I would love if you would begin with a little reading because, you know, the book has only been out for a week. So maybe we need to set the scene for people who haven't got around to reading it yet. Let's go. Okay, <clears throat> so I'm just going to read a little bit to introduce you all to um, Phoebe, who's the main character and the narrator of all of this, um, and a couple of other characters. All right, the first entry is Thursday, the 4th of January, and the hashtag is Furball Central. I don't actually mind staying at Kate's house. The positives outweigh the negatives as follows. Positive things about staying at Kate's house. Unlike mum, Kate no longer works as a war doctor and is therefore able to provide me with food, shelter and emotional support. She treats me like a flatmate, not like a five-year-old. When she goes off on one, I struggle to be offended because she turns so Scottish that I basically can't understand what she's saying. Negative things about staying at Kate's house. I have to take the bus to school, the designer cats. How is it possible that I've known those cats forever, but I still can't tell which is which? I can only ever tell them apart when they're sitting right next to each other, just like Kaylee and Melody Sessions. The designer cats are going to be bigger pain in the ass than usual too, because they are A, in heat, and B, under strict house arrest, because Kate has scheduled a shag fest in High Barnet for them so they can get have designer kittens at the very same time. Mum always jokes about Kate ending up as a crazy cat lady, but hello, it's already happened. Who drives their cats all the way to High Barnet to get shagged? 
there's a designer boy cat up there, also Persian, obviously, who's going to shag the designer cats all weekend. And then Kate is going to sell the designer kittens for like 500 pounds each. Imagine there are eight of them. That's 4,000 pounds. This place is going to be Furball Central. Oh, and FYI, the creepiest thing is that the cats are mother and daughter. Imagine a sex orgy with your mother. And then think about this. If you had a baby with your mum's boyfriend and your mum had a baby with him too, then your child would have the same dad as your brother slash sister. And basically, how gross is that? Thank you so much for introducing us to the inimitable world and voice of Phoebe. Um, how are you? How are you doing? Let's begin with that question. It's a tough old time. How are you doing? Me, I'm I'm fine. I'm, you know, I'm healthy and um, fed. I'm very well looked after. I've got a lovely uh, home um, and I get to write all day long at the moment, which is actually a real blessing because I can't deal with anything that happens outside. Um, so yeah, I think I'm one of the very, very lucky beans at the moment. I'm glad to hear it. Mm. Um, so I know you did the MA for writing for young people at Bath Spa. Is that where this book began its life? Tell us yeah. about the origins of this excellent book. <laughs> yes, well, that's where it, it did it did come to life there. I, um, Phoebe kind of came to me um, one day and I was experimenting with her for a while. And actually it's really interesting that she's she's become such a um, lovable character because she really, she was created, um, she comes from such a dark place. And when I first, like I took her to a few workshop sessions um, and I remember one of my tutors, he said to me, you know, he said, Vipka, you really like, you're just on the edge of bad taste with this. And I thought, yeah, you know, you're right. And so I had to, I had to really work with it. But, um, um, but yeah, um, I, it was great just having had the opportunity to um, really take time with this character um, and see where she goes. And, and one day she was just there. She really was just there. And it was really odd because I think as a writer, you, sometimes it's such a struggle to to um, find this this person and this voice, and it's never quite there. Like you kind of think you know what you're doing, but you don't. Um, and the moment Phoebe was in the room, it was like it just it took off. It was it was such a joy. Was it just a kind of a question of finding the right story for her to live out her personality and be a vehicle for that? Yeah, I think so. And I think um, I think a real um, turning point was I was trying to decide on the format of the novel. And um, I remember this, I was in a, in a, in a tutorial with my manuscript tutor, Joan Aiden, and she said to me, look, she's like, you know, what you want? Is it a diary or is it this? But you can't have both. And I was like, oh, I don't know. And so I went home and I did a bit of writing and and then I had decided for myself it was going to be a diary and the um, and I think that, you know, for those of you who have ever kept a diary, it is it is such a it's such a private place. Um, and I think because I gave Phoebe really that little, you know, that that tiny space where she could just be. Um, and I think that that the format made the difference when it came to her and the story. And is that something you worked on through your MA? What is was this your final pro project? Yeah, it was my final project. I actually, I spent very little time, once I found her, workshopping her, I wrote everything. Like the MA is so fantastic. I, you know, one week, like we were encouraged to write widely and I really did. Like I, I wrote everything. I wrote, um, like I wrote some middle grade. I wrote this fabulous science fiction thing. Um, I wrote, I wrote like this little poem about, a, I don't know, about a witch um, for for little for early readers um, and I really really um, yeah every time something was given to me as an opportunity to to write something new or something I wouldn't normally write I would just I would jump at it and I I I went with that and Phoebe kind of ticked 
in the background then but yeah she was my my final project um yeah and she's just such a kind of interesting character because she is so sure of how she sees the world and it is fun to kind of see the world through such uh absolutist eyes even if she isn't always kind of right about everything um so you you said that when you first kind of wrote it she was I mean she's still very spiky but was she she was too spiky it was that the kind of feedback that you felt yeah I think she was she was a bit angry but then I think at the time I was a bit angry so you know you can't can't help but feed that into your work somehow um and I was yeah there are like so many things in the world annoyed me and annoy me and I think you know if you then try to kind of work that into your stories if it's something that's very um very recent it, it often doesn't you know it's not it it hasn't accumulated in the story itself and it can be quite like oh my yeah. god what was I you know like calm down woman so it was a bit like that you gotta let the the gripes and the irritation percolate for a while absolutely sometimes it's just too fresh um <laughs> So would you like to read another little little bit for us? I can ask you some more questions, but I just, I feel like it's just good to hear her voice, you know? Do you know, this isn't, she doesn't have like whatever accent I have though. I always feel like a fraud because I'm really not this, this woman, this girl, um, but okay, right. I will read you a little bit um, about Phoebe's thoughts about school. Um, and the entry is Tuesday, the 1st of May, and the hashtag is stressing, not stressing. Today, Craig Sullivan told me he was starting to stress about GCSEs. And so I spent the rest of the day wondering if that means it's time for me to start stressing too, because Craig Sullivan never revises for anything because he's got a photographic memory. At lunch, Matilda Hollingsworth was like, I've basically had no time to wash my hair and like, a week and so I basically had to buy dry shampoo on my way to school. I'm not being funny but if you've basically got time to go to school via the shops and buy dry shampoo you've basically got time to wash your hair like everybody else. She needs to get over herself basically. I don't agree with us having to do GCSEs in English the way we have to do them. I mean English language is fine because we need more people to know that could off doesn't actually mean anything apart from the fact that you don't know how to speak English. But why do I need to interpret a poem? What's my opinion got to do with GCSEs? And besides, it's not that you're actually allowed your own opinion anyway, because you have to say what the teachers want you to say or what the GCSE revision guide suggests you say. Everyone always goes on about how it's so beneficial in life to be well read but mentioning something we've read for GCSEs neither makes you clever, nor does it make you sound clever because everyone else has read it too and has the same opinion on it because that's the only opinion your brain was trained slash allowed to remember. I reckon that's why everyone's so stupid. And one more thing, no one's ever admitted to hating Romeo and Juliet because you can't possibly say anything against Shakespeare. And I swear you'd fail GCSEs if you did, even if you backed it up with the best arguments ever. Fair enough, Shakespeare was popular and wrote a lot of plays, but Romeo and Juliet is actually a bit shit, isn't it? It's basically teenagers throwing a massive tantrum. Sure, it must be totally annoying if your parents don't allow you to go out with someone, but do you kill yourself literally five minutes later? In my opinion, Romeo and Juliet is a crap story well written, which disproves the theory that apparently you can't polish a turd. But can I say that? No. You can say that. She can't. Um, so kind of given that this event is hosted by Gaze the Word, I hope it's not too much of a spoiler to say that part of the book is about uh, kind of figuring out your sexuality. And I'm very interested in this as someone who has written, you know, something with similar elements. Did it feel like a big response? You know, when you're writing for young people, it feels like a big kind of responsibility. Did you feel that? Tell me about that. I think if you want to change the world, you have to 
address young people because it's too late for us. You know, we're set in our ways. We're all like boring and um, totally, you know, yeah, a bit rubbish, really. So um, for me, and for me, I have always I. It's interesting because I grew up in a very different time um, because I'm very old. Um, but I've never had this thing in my brain that people clearly have um, about like gender or sexuality. Um, it never existed for me. Like I, I have known all my life that I could be attracted to any other person, um, regardless of you know their sexuality or the color of their skin or whether or not they spoke English or like Marmite or whatever. Um, so for me. Um, really, I wanted to write, like, I want to write about that. I want to write people who, to whom that also doesn't matter. Because um, I think, you know, we, we always would try so hard to, to tell these stories. But, um, you know, as soon as you, even as soon as you put that label on something, you know, there are people who are like, oh, no, you know, I'm not going to read that because that's, you know, that's gay or that has lesbians in it or that has, you know, whatever, um, like a trans character. Uh, just tell the story. It doesn't have to be about that. And I really, 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 really wanted to write that. You know, this is this is a love story. It it doesn't matter that it's two girls. I, you know, and I, I didn't want anybody to have like an existential crisis about it or um, have to explain themselves. Um, because to me, in my, you know, the dream I have of the future, it just doesn't matter. Like people don't care. You know, you can do, you just do these things. You know, these people, I don't know, she has a wife, he has a husband, she's married to her husband, you know, um, these people, I don't know, there's three of them, I don't care, you know, just let's just be a little bit less judgmental about it all. And I, yeah, I, I I've really, I, I, I really wanted that for this book um, very, very much. For it to be just a kind of, it's a love story, it's a figuring out things story because it's about a young person and everyone is always figuring stuff out when they're a young person and hopefully continue to figure stuff out into adulthood. Um, yeah, it's it's delightful, I loved it. Um, so obviously I am just, I know that even as a, an author myself, I am still nerdishly interested in other people's kind of publication stories, um, how things happened. So what, how did you, how did you end up publishing your book? How did you get your agent? I just like knowing these things. And I'm sure there's like people listening who are aspiring authors who would also like to know this. Um, well, I, um, it's, a, it's been a long journey for sure. I started, um, it's about 15 years. Well, I've always written. And then about 15 years ago, I thought, oh, um, you know, like I was doing a job that I hated and I was quite good at it. And I thought, you know, if I can be good at something that I despise from my very soul, you know, like imagine in theory, how good could I be at something that I actually enjoy doing? So I, um, um, I, yeah, I started taking writing workshops um, where I was introduced to the young adult genre, which I wasn't aware existed. Um, but yeah, my tutor, this was at uh, Bournemouth Arts University. I did an evening course. And my my tutor, she said, she read my stuff and she said, oh, you know what, this is, this is young adult. Um, and I didn't know what that was. So I then thought, well, if that's naturally what I write into, then, you know, and that's what I enjoy, I should read up on it. And I, I took about six months reading everything. Everything everyone had ever written in the young adult genre. I just read like a crazy person. Um, and so of course, you know, the more you read, I then knew, I knew what that genre meant. I knew what people were talking about. I knew who was who. Um, and I thought, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go for this. Um, and then I went, um, I did a week with the Arvon Foundation where, um, which was phenomenal because, you know, in life, you're always, whenever you meet a group of people, it's always like, oh, you know, what's your name? What do you do? And I was like, I work this job I hate. 
that you know isn't a representation of who I am at all. And then you walk into this house this during this Avon week, and no one cares where you come from or what you do or what you've done um, because you're the writer. And I found that so liberating. And then I kind of arrived at that place within myself that I thought, you know what, I'm 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 a writer. This is this is what I what I'm going to do. Um, and then, yeah, I applied for the for the MA at Bath Spa um, and I got on it, which was a miracle, um, really, because I'd never been to university before um, and it was a master's program. And I thought, oh, my God, you know, these people are going to like laugh me out of the <laughs> classroom. I didn't even English wasn't even my first language. And I was like and it said on the uni thing, oh, you know, if English isn't your first language, you may have to do this language test. And I was like, oh, my God, kill me, because I literally I can't. I don't know why I speak English. I just do. You know, I can't like start having to do like some like grammar bits. Or whatever. Whatever. So I was like, oh, my God. Um, so yeah. anyway, I got on the MA and then. Um, because the standard is so high on that course and um, people really bring everything they've got to the table, I just, I, I honestly, I lived for it. I did it part-time and I, I, I lived for it. I invested my, my whole being in this course and I worked so hard. I don't think I've ever worked that hard um, in all my life. I like had a job alongside it and I was working and then I had to move house and it was just it was absolutely just a really really hard time um but I I thought you know if I don't give this my best shot then I'm an idiot um and then so you know 15 years I worked really hard did everything kind of you know you do when you want to become a published author and then into my life comes the luck of my life, which is our lovely agent, Rachel. The curly-haired um, angel. The curly-haired angel, this beautiful, tiny little thing who, um, yeah. I don't know just... how she is. I've never met her. She's my agent, but I've never met her. Oh Isn't my that God. She's like this awesome. tiny little thing. I once tried to hide behind her in a hallway when there was like the Gruffalo people, Axel Scheffler and Julia Donaldson. And I was like, oh my God, she's this tiny little thing. I can't hide behind her. Um, but yeah, and she, yeah, she's the absolute, she's, she's the luck that sometimes you're gifted and the, the luck you absolutely need in, in any creative field where someone looks at your work and says, you know what, yes, like, yes to this. Um, and then, I mean, as soon, soon as she had the manuscript, she dragged me around London. I don't really, I don't really recall. It was like two weeks where we saw all these publishers and had breakfast and it was just crazy and then like at one point she just <laughs> I remember that I sat at the office you know when we were allowed out oh, um, people had offices and things oh my god and I was sat there and I was like all like exhausted you know on the sofa and she's going to the printer and she's like shoving these two contracts and she's like which is it which is it which is it gonna be and I was like oh my god we're gonna sell this thing and it hadn't even occurred to me until that very moment that people actually wanted to have it so yeah that was um so it, it just turned into an absolute love story of a publication story because after all that hard work it suddenly was really easy and people are going to really hate me for saying that but it it, it was once luck had arrived after 15 years of solid work <laughs> yes, yes. I after was... all that after all that horror and you know all the blood sweat and tears there's Rachel so yeah I love that for you <laughs> um do you so now that you, you've got your your publishing contract you are um you're in the Macmillan stable you are being edited do you like being edited how, how do you feel about do you feel like your MA maybe set you up to cope with the editing process uh, definitely. I think um, I I love getting notes, as I was saying before we started here. Um, I love getting notes because I think it's really important to be better. Um, and I, I really I've enjoyed the editing process because, um, again, you know, people who've whose job that is um, read your book and they come with questions, which is great because there are always questions you haven't asked yourself um and also they they kind of 
they they introduce you to like this whole other layer of publishing, which of course you you must consider, and you, you know probably you probably don't when when you're just writing, especially if you haven't been published before. You know, like it's you really have nothing to lose as a as a first time writer. You can just go crazy. It was a really different experience now working on book two, um, where basically <laughs> my editor was like, "Babe, you're gonna have to do that again <laughs> because it's not very good." And you know, but again, it's 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 you just you go back and you do it again and they always have such good questions and such good feedback that you can't help but be better yeah and it is kind of reassuring to have someone you know whether that's your agent or your editor whose job it is to literally know how to make your work better like they are paid to make this book good it is in their financial interests to make it as good as it can be um so that's i think that's like a real kind of you know blessing of being in the the publishing machine is having people whose literal job it is to care about the quality of your work um i would love to hear your final reading if you right. would be so kind Right, kids. Now, if you have kids there and you're a bit, um, you haven't had that conversation yet, you have a choice now. You can either have them listen or you can cover their ears. Right. Um, the day is Friday, the 23rd of March, and the hashtag is Easter break. Today was the last day of school before the Easter break. And I was just like, okay. I'm going to have to talk to Polly about the clitoris because I'm not going to see her for like three weeks. And then the topic will have lost its momentum. Also, I wanted to prove to her that I was listening and that I still care about her. And I do want her to be happy, even though I despise her boyfriend and she's erased me from my life like it's nothing. So at lunch, I walked over to her and Tristan and I was like, can I talk to you for five minutes? Tristan looked proper put out, of course, but I was just like, Sorry, mate. And then I led Polly away by her elbow. Polly was like, what is it? Are you okay? You need to tell him about the clitoris. Excuse me? You have to tell Tristan about the clitoris. He's clearly missing it. And I don't think the penis is designed to do much with it or to it. And so you have to show him something else. Are you insane? What? No, honestly, him finding the clitoris will help. Fuck off, Phoebe. This isn't about the clitoris. Besides, that's not the only way to make a woman come. Why do you have to be so condescending all the time? Do you act like everyone is stupid apart from you? Maybe I didn't want an instruction manual and maybe I know about the clitoris, but maybe I just wanted someone to talk to. And then she just left me standing there. In an ideal world, I would have shouted, don't be pissed off with me. I'm not the one who's shit in bed, but obviously I'm not a bitch. And also it's clearly about the clitoris. I love it. How amazingly, like delightfully liberating must it be to just, to be a young person and reading that and not feel like you're being kind of patronized, um, not feel like uh, anyone's kind of messing you around. They are just, offering it to you on a level that makes sense, feels truthful. I am delighted for the readers of today to have you writing for them. Um, another thing I'm always nerdishly interested in, and maybe other people are too, I hope they are. Um, I like knowing how people write, like how do you write? Do you write in long bursts? Do you write a little bit every day? Like, do you have rituals or are you just very like, I just need to get it done? Tell me about it. Um when I first start out with something, I do quite a bit of writing by hand. Um, and then when I think I've figured it out, I will sit down and I will always, always write a first draft in a month. I will write 2000 words a day and I will do that every day. Um, and then it will be done. And by the time I have the first draft, I kind of then will know <laughs> what it, what I'm saying because I never know what I'm saying until you know I've said it. Um, and then um, 
yeah, then I do like to take my time to go through it, but I'm quite regimented. I have to say when I'm working on a project, I do like to get it done. And I mean, writing is, it's like anything else. You just have to, you really have to do the work, you know? I mean, sometimes I look at it and I'm like, oh, someone else write it, I can't do it. But, um, you know, it's, it's going to be you. It's going to be just you, forever you, who's going to have to write those words. So um, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm disciplined, which is good. It's very good. Because <laughs> there's no point being talented and then having no actual outlet for your talent because you are, oh, yeah. you know, you can't just kind of focus on the work. Yeah, you know, I actually really hate that when people are like, oh, well, she's so talented. No, she just works really hard. It's like, you know, like I, I'm, like I'm, I'm, I play the cello a bit and every day, like I'm doing these scales and I'm thinking, you know, like I could never be a professional, not because I lack talent, but because I can't be bothered. Like I honestly, I can't do it. I can't sit there for five hours every day and do bloody scales. And then there's going to be a cellist who's like, I would love to write YA novels but I just don't have the discipline yes um, it is but writing you know it's just words it's just words you just have to you know just, have to try hard um and how has it, maybe it's hard to disentangle writing your second book from the pandemic but I was going to ask how has the the pandemic affected your writing <laughs> um well it's I've written um like a crazy person last year I wrote four full manuscripts um just because I was obsessed and I couldn't deal with anything else also I'd, I no longer had a day job suddenly so you know I had all this time and I thought oh like I'm gonna have to I'm gonna have to use it I'm gonna have to do something so I wrote all of these things and I haven't even looked back at them because I don't think I can but um, I mean, not at the moment, but um, yeah, I was I was absolutely obsessed. Um, but then when I um, had to do actual work and work on book two and <laughs> my editor was like, I, no was, <laughs> like okay. I was like, okay, I'm gonna have to actually also concentrate. Um, but that's been that's been okay because I do like I do like a, a task. I think it's important to have a task, especially, in these times I think if you're just sitting at home without a task you go crazy well I'm glad you have a task even if it's the very kind of crunchy brain tedious task of redoing work you've already done I know yeah it's it's hard to motivate yourself to do a task like that um so I was going to ask if you're working on anything new but I feel like you've made it abundantly clear that you are working on new things is it uh a sequel yes it is a sequel it is and if um i mean it's it's actually really good i'm really glad it came back to me because it did absolutely suck like the first version of it was just the worst thing ever so i'm really happy it was given back to me with um a lot of love and advice um and i'm happy i got to do it again because it is great um and it's kind of you know, it's one step up. I mean, this is, you know, Phoebe prior relationship. Now we're getting her in a relationship. Like she's also, you know, having sexual relations and we'll know all about that. And it's just, it's really, really good. And I'm actually really excited about it. I thought I wanted to kill myself before Christmas because I was like, I'm not doing it again. Um, but yeah, I have, and it's, it's actually, I think it's good. Unless of course, you know, it comes back to me in a few weeks and they're like, still oh bad. God, what have you done? What is this? Yeah, no. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. Watch the space. <laughs> yeah. I think that's like a really delightful thing about the editing process is that you, you know, it generally are just watching it get better and better and better. And that's very reassuring that it is possible to, take the wheel and steer yourself in the right direction. Um, so do you, what, what are you reading right now? I'm always interested in what authors are reading. I just, I'm no more. I'm reading, I'm laughing. I think my friend is laughing. I'm reading autobiography of Catherine Janeway, who is Voyage, Star Trek Voyager's <laughs> captain. And it's complete, I mean, it's all fictional. Obviously. I mean, she's fictional. She's getting 
autobiography. She's fictional. She doesn't even exist. It's fabulous. It's Margaret, is that the actress? She's the actress, but this okay, isn't so what Margaret. Margaret is no, okay. this is literally this, and that's what I'm reading. And you know what? I mean, it's great. It's it's giving me everything um, I need in my sad little life right now. Yeah, that's like literally my kind of dream writing project is to write something like that. Like I just love it. Because I'm not like an ideas person. So if someone really, you know, brought an idea to me and was just like, do this, I'd be like, you will have it in two weeks and it will be oh amazing. My- I promise. Yeah. I'm like, honestly, it's like my biggest dream as a writer is to like write for a franchise because they'll be yeah. like, okay, these are the characters and these are their voices. And what we want is something just really exciting. And, you know, you figure it out. I'll be like, yeah, yeah. that's fine. Give me so if anyone people. is listening, you've got two people <laughs> who want to write like Babysitter's Club and Sweet Valley High yes, for the next time we'll along. Yeah. Um, well, that was a very um, plot twist answer to what are you reading? I'm I, I'm very surprised, but in a good way. Because <laughs> um, we, we have met before in person in the before times. And we met at an event kind of similar to this, but in real life, where I was talking to the wonderful Juno Dawson. Do you read a lot of YA? Even now, even after you consumed all of the YA that has ever been published. (laughs) Yeah, I do read a lot of YA. However, um, you know, yours was actually the, the last YA book I read at the end of, because I, when I write, um, I don't read YA when I write because I um, I need to just be the only person who's speaking in those voices. So I, I write, I, I read other things when I'm working, you know, in a real, like to a deadline. But um, yeah, I I love, I love YA. I think I live for it. I, I just think it's just the best stuff that's out there because it's so real. Like it's great. And it's, like that's think, it's really real. It is. And I was um, like, there are some things like I'm just because your book is there, but there are things I, I, I read when I read your book, I was, you know, they're just the way I think young people take time to um, experience certain moments. It's just like, it's so, so true. And I, I love coming across that in a kind of, you know, kind of reminds me of who I am. And and that's that's why I love it. And I do, yeah, no, I do read it a lot when I'm not. Watching. I'm glad to hear it. I'm glad you 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 still have your love for YA, even though you read literally every book yeah. that has been published. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm conscious of stealing people's questions by asking them myself, and I feel like there's quite a lot building up. So maybe we should switch over to Erica's excellent chairing talents and have a few from our good friends at home. Is that okay? You, you happy with that? Yeah, absolutely. There are, the questions have been pouring in. Um, there's some, there were some, there's been loads of love for you both. Um, and uh, Bibka, everyone's just very excited for you. I don't know if you'll get a chance to look at the chat box before we sign off, but um, loads of love. A couple people had to leave early, but wishing you well. Um, you both of your agents uh, um i think it was uh rachel and um and joe unwin were also bantering back and forth when you were talking about her so it's it's just all great um so the first question that kind of leads on to from what you were saying so let me see if i can find out where it was um Oh yes, just about teenage readers. I thought this would be a good follow on from that. Um, have you, I know it's only been out a week, so it's still early days, but have you had any feedback yet from teenage readers of Love is for Losers? Um, <laughs> someone, I tell you what, it's really funny. Some people have um, contacted me on, on Instagram and, but their question is, how old are you? And I'm like, I'm like, I'm sorry, but you know, and also of course I'm telling everyone a different thing because that's what I always do. So, and people are like, I really need it. Like I'm writing a book report on it. How old are you? And I'm like, I'm 750 years old. So yeah. (laughs) 
All right. So we'll see. We'll see what they can come in. Hopefully they'll start to ask more um, <laughs> complex questions or <laughs> get more feedback. Um, we had a couple questions um, and you sort of touched on it. We know that it's about Phoebe and about sex, but just wondering about like, you know, book two and if you can tell us anything more about it. Sounds like it's in the early stages um, and kind of what you're, what else you're working on. The, the couple, amalgamation of a couple questions there. Um, well, um, book two is, I mean, I wish I could, I wish I could share so much with you. It's, it's great. Phoebe kind of, um, let's just say her horizon gets, um, I mean, she, <laughs> she, she discovers a lot about herself, um, but in her very own unique way. So it's, um, it's, it's great. And I kind of, I mean, I can't, I don't know what's going to actually like end up in it, what, what I will be allowed to write, but um, I've kind of taken her very um, bizarre way of looking at things to say stuff that's not necessarily on the page in a lot of contemporary YA. I know putting sex on the page is quite acceptable if you're writing a fantasy genre or so, but not so in contemporary um, fiction. So I'm going to really, I'm, I'm trying to find a really clever way to test out <laughs> what, <laughs> how I can like wiggle myself in, but yeah, it's going to be, um, it's, it's going to talk about sex a lot. Also the question, you know, what is sex? What does it mean? Um, mm -hmm. You know, when people say, oh, you know, have you had sex? Because of course everyone, like, you know, if you ask people, a majority of people will assume that is some sort of penis and vagina goings on, you know, this this whole holy grail of, you know, oh my God, have you had the sex? But, you know, is it? I mean, I, I don't know, what does it mean to you? What does it mean to Phoebe? What does it mean to Polly or, you know, to Miriam or all the other people in the book? So I'm really, um, I'm going on a quest with that. I like the sound of that a lot. <laughs> that sounds fantastic. Really, really important too, as well as a uh, heck of a lot of fun. Um, so look forward to reading that. Um, uh, lots of, uh, Bibka, lots of uh, in the comments, um, look, saying that you look really wonderful and you're really vibrant and glowing. So lots of like love for you there. Um, and um, so want you to absorb that as it's coming through. <laughs> Um, and there's a question, and I wonder actually if, if maybe both of you would, since you're both YA authors and readers of YA, if you would both read it, oh, read it, answer it. Um, the question is, what are your all-time favorite YA novels that you've read? And that's from Rick. Um, I have I have an answer. Um, my all-time favorite YA novel is Pet by Akweke Amazi. Um, the plot is quite difficult to nutshell. So I will not. But um, if you read any kind of YA or any books, really, for any age, if you want an amazing book that you will race through and just it's so unlike anything I've ever read. A Quake Amazie has just such a kind of unique and uh, mind expanding perspective on the world and gender and is just an incredible author and yeah pet is uh, their YA novel and I cannot recommend it enough there's, a, there's another uh, agreement in the comments there too yeah pet hive assemble <laughs> um I think um my one of my favorite YA novels is the absolute true diary of a part-time Indian by um what's his name? Sharman Alexi is the writer. Mm -hmm. And um, for me, it's, um, it's, it's, it's a masterclass in, in storytelling. It's a masterclass in how to talk about really, really difficult subjects. Um, I think it's one of the most commonly banned books in US school libraries. So everyone should definitely read it. Um, and yeah, it's, I love it. I've read it many times. Um, because I, yeah, I kind of, kind of always think that's the standard I want to be writing to. Mm -hmm. Both great recommendations. Um, and uh, Pet is definitely available in the UK. Um, 
diary of a part-time Indian. I'm not sure if it's available in the UK, but um, I will check and see if we can import it because um, <laughs> we do that. Um, so another question that could possibly pose to both of you again. Um, so the question is, what three pieces of advice would you give to young aspiring female writers? Three. Hmm. I guess um, my general writing advice is always to like just do it and not get too kind of caught up in uh, the kind of fetishi fetishization of writing and the writer and by like uh, I never thought I would write a novel because I didn't think I was like people who wrote novels because I'm very like sociable and confident and you know there's this real investment in this kind of image of like writers as being very kind of introverted and serious and because I'm very like fluffy and uh yeah not very serious I was just like oh that's for other people not for me so if you are capable of sitting down and writing words and producing work you are a writer so to kind of not buy too much into any of the extraneous stuff that is not the work of writing. That is my number one tip. That is my only tip. Vipka, how about you? I, I actually, I, I agree with with what you've said. Absolutely. I think the the my number one most important tip: stop calling yourself aspiring writers because you're either a writer or you're not. And I don't think it matters if like w where your work sits. You know, you're either you you're a writer or you're not. It's really that easy. Um, then um, I think it's important to be bold and really tell your story. You know, don't be, don't be embarrassed by if you, if you want to write, I don't know, whatever it is you want to write, don't be embarrassed by what truly drives you. Um, and also listen, listen to advice. It's, I think it's really important to listen to what, to get feedback. I, I, I think if you, yeah, if you, if you can't, if you're not able to share your work and get that feedback, I think it's going to be a really difficult job to have. Yeah, I feel like your your MA probably is that like, or any kind of, uh, yeah, I feel like there's kind of always conversations about like uh, publishing or creative writing MAs or, you know, courses and stuff. But I just think, and I've never, you know, never uh, done one, but I just think from the point of view of having your work read and kind of critiqued by other people that is such a kind of formative part of being a writer and it must prepare you in a way that like people who decide to avoid those avenues because they think you know there's no kind of value in them that must really kind of miss out on that hmm. any more questions Yes, sorry, I was kind of in, in the middle of like thinking about that. And it was, yes. Um, <laughs> so those were good. I think those were great responses, even if they weren't three each. Um, but they were really, I think, excellent advice. And I think the idea of like not calling yourself an aspiring writer is really important too. Um, thinking about craft and maybe some of the things, again, that you kind of uh, got to try out and practice on your MA. Um, so we have uh, one comment here from Charlie. It says, Hi, Vivka. I love Phoebe, Phoebe's sense of humor and observations. How did you find her voice and what makes her tick? Um, <laughs> I, uh, her voice just came to me one day. I just, as I said, you know, as soon as I knew it was a diary, she was there. And what makes her tick? Stupid people make her tick more than anything. She hates stupid people like she hates them she can't you know it's that person it's the and we all hate them and we can all admit to it but she hates it she you know she gets in line in the shop and you know she's waiting for 20 minutes and then the lady in front you know realizes that she needs to get her money out and it takes like you know another 10 minutes and phoebe just hates it because she's like you knew you had to pay this entire time we've waited. Why is it now you're looking for your wallet? And why do you have like 10 bags you need to look through to find your wallet? Like Phoebe hates it. She hates it. Excellent. Excellent. Yes. Um, yeah, definitely. 
Um, and another kind of craft question around um, Phoebe as well. Um, uh, but I will read the preamble because it's from LMA and Clan because um, it's so lovely. It says, Vodka, you look like you're glowing with happiness that is well deserved. Uh, apart from Phoebe, Clan wonders what kind of story you'd love to write. And I wonder what you may have had to cut from Phoebe's journey that you miss the most. Ooh. Um, well, okay. The first question, what I would like to write is science fiction, but I'm not clever enough to write science fiction. Science fiction writers are very, very clever people who come up with all these things and all these worlds and all these aliens and all these languages and all this stuff. I cannot, I, I would like to, um, and, and I am trying, I am trying, um, but yeah, that would be my absolute dream to write something like that. Um, and what I had to, well, yeah, I had to cut um, what Phoebe lost were a few like moments, you know, sometimes in life when you say things that are really not okay. And, but you only know that way after. So in the, in the context of a book, that's really difficult. You can't write a character that says something that is really not acceptable even if she was to learn the lesson 50 pages later. So that's what I had to um, kind of do without, with Phoebe, I had to really turn that back. But I think it would have been, would have been nice to, to see her, um, yeah, um, her immediate reaction to things a little bit more, just because then that gives her a bigger journey. But I kind of, I hope I did that anyway, but um, yeah, I had to, I had to lose a lot of her, um, <laughs> sass and she's still got she's still got loads of it too so um yeah so hopefully you know hopefully readers <laughs> who haven't yet read it will will see that see that come through but that makes that makes sense um just the last question there and I, i'm sorry that we're not getting to everyone's questions you've all been brilliant um loads of questions about films and who would play you and who would you know would you want it to be turned into a film and all that kind of stuff but um i just love this question uh it's just from kat mckenna she says or they say um please can you write me a full novel about the designer cats thank you no, I hate those cats. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not even a cat person. I live in this house with my best friend who is over there, who I've known since we were babies. And she has, look, she's carrying a cat now. She's carrying a cat. Oh, like a shop. <laughs> and there's too many cats in this house. There's five cats in this house. And I don't, I don't even like them. So, and, but I didn't even write that book when I lived here. I only moved in with all the cats after I'd written the book. So I don't know if that's like some kind of karma, um, some awful, awful karma. <laughs> and no cat, you cannot have a cat book. I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it. Well, you I think with your book too. <laughs> 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 I think um, I think the, the questioner may be disappointed, but um, but someone <laughs> Kat says uh, she will. The, sorry, I don't know your pronouns, Cat. Um, they will grind you down. Um, so yes, uh, so maybe or maybe maybe Cat, you need to write that book because um, that would be hilarious. Um, so more more books, please. Um, I've just popped up, although I'm not quite sure the link worked. Um, we've got signed copies of Love Is for Losers in uh, Gaze the Word Bookshop. So I've just popped those links up there. I'm going to repeat the one. There it is for uh, Love Is for Losers. If you haven't already got a copy and read it, it's there. We've also still got copies of, uh, of course, and we'll continue to have copies of Melt My Heart um, by Bethany, um, which was one of my books for uh, 2020. Um, and we've also got a cheeky Valentine's page that we've put up. Uh, both books are, of course, uh, listed there. Um, so if you want to, if you're looking to send anyone, we'll send them out a little message. Write us a note if you don't want it sent out until closer to Valentine's Day or you have a secret admirer message, etc. We can do all that. But um, for now, thank you so much, Vibka. Thank you so much, Bethany. An excellent event. If we can like get a, like a visual like round of applause for these two, um, amazing. Thank you so much. Um, you for having us, it was delightful for me at least. Good. Thank you. It was great. I was very nervous. I'm very happy that you all were very kind. Thank you. And it was so wonderful to see such an amazing turnout. So thank you, everyone who came. Um, hopefully we'll be gathering in the bookshop at some point, uh, you know, this year would be lovely. Um, but take care of yourselves until then. And um, we'll see you all soon.
Thank you. Thank you.